Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is one o'clock and we still have a few people rolling in, um, but I'm going to go ahead and get started with some introductory materials um, so that we can uh, we can get this, this going. I am Jen Nelson with the Delaware Association of Soil Cons or the Delaware Association of Conservation Districts. And uh, this is the next in our tax ditch modernization work group series uh, about financing tax ditches. Let's see, so next slide, please. There we go. So session five today will provide a more in-depth overview of how tax ditches finance maintenance activities. This includes presenting information how uh, tax ditch assessments are assigned to parcels, how the tax ditch rate or warrant can be calculated and is levied, and the role of the Denrec tax ditch program and county offices to include the board of assessment, receiver, or taxes, and treasury play in preparing, filing, and collecting the tax ditch or warrant. Given the constraints that are highlighted in the background information, we will have a discussion surrounding whether or not tax ditch organizations can collect sufficient funds for routine tax ditch operations. And in addition, a specific issue identified by tax ditch officers has been uh, the challenges that are associated with substantial back taxes being owed to the organization. It's our hope that this work group can offer some guidance on ideas on how to resolve this issue with the expertise that we have here in the room today. So those who've been asked to attend this se session include tax ditch officers, commissioners, and support agencies ranging from those with responsibilities associated with filing, recording, and collecting the, di the ditch tax to those agencies that offer guidance in evaluating needs and helping officers to determine an appropriate tax rate when requested. Let's see. Okay. So uh, for today's workshop, we have about an hour where we're going over kind of the background financial information on the uh, calculations associated with assessment bases and warrant rates. Um, we have a break then at two o'clock, and then we'll come back and talk about back taxes, expenses, and opportunities to raise funds to support operations. So it's a lot of information today. We've got some polls that are uh, sprinkled throughout, um, but we're also, um, we don't have any breakout sessions in, in this session. Um, and so I think between the poll questions that we're going to ask, and if people have questions, uh, you can put those in the chat. And we also, I think, have some opportunity for open dialogue today. There's not a, a whole lot of participants on this call. And so I think with this one, we can feel free to kind of unmute as questions come up where we can, we can add that to the discussion. So uh, here we have the instructions again for answering poll questions. Um, <clears throat> so if you haven't done this with us before, so you'll want to open up a new text on your phone. So the number that you're texting to is 22333. And then the message that you send to that is Jen Nelson 484. And then you should get a confirmation that you've joined the poll and you can proceed from there. Okay, so we've got a couple of polls to start us out. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen to get started on the first one. Let's see. Can everybody see it? Okay, great. So the first question that we have is what is the most limiting resource for tax ditches to be effective? Is it money, contractors, officer involvement, technical expertise, or is it something else that we haven't listed here? Helps if I turn the poll on. There we go. Okay. So far, money and officer involvement are coming in as our key challenges. Maybe more money than officer involvement. I'll give it just another minute here and see what else. 
Okay. And I don't know while these are coming in, if anybody wants to unmute, if they have any kind of, uh, if you want to elaborate at all on your response or your thoughts here, but you're welcome to. All right. So that gives us a good baseline for where we're starting from. So money is maybe the most limiting for most people uh, for the tax ditches to be effective. Um, but the other issues are are present as well. So officer involvement, technical expertise, and and contractors are factors as well. So I'm going to go back to my list. We're going to do another one here, and then we can start into some of that background information. Let me activate this one as well. So do individual tax ditches need more funds to be effective? And if so, how much? Okay, so if... Uh, your current funding is sufficient. That's our first line, that's an A. And then we've got some, some different levels, or if you're not sure. Jen? Yeah, Is that Joel? Hey, hey, it's Joel. I, I got the text, the 22333, but what do I need to put in after that to participate? Okay, um, you need to enter. Jen a Nelson. text. You need to send me a text. Jen Nelson 484. 484. And then you hit send. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Jen Nelson 484. And then you send that and you'll receive a confirmation that you've joined the poll. Okay. Thanks for the question. Jen, Jen. This, <laughs> it says Jen. I'm, I'm doing that, but it says Jen, Jennifer B E I N E. Uh, last name, so I don't know why, but anyway, don't wait for me. Continue. It must be something I'm doing. <laughs> so you <laughs> gotta like, make you gotta make sure in the number. So in the number yeah. is the two two three three three, and then where you put your words. Yep. Are Jen Nelson four eight four. Right. Yeah, that's how I did it. But it looks like there's another Jen that's trying to do a poll, but she's not started yet. So <laughs> I don't know. Go ahead. I would say my answer anyway would be. For right now, our current funding is sufficient. So that would be a verbal poll. Okay. Thank you. I'll take it. Thanks, Joel. Okay. So it looks like most of our responses are coming in in that one to fifteen thousand dollar one thousand to fifteen thousand dollar range. And then a lot. You know, if you include the that segment there up to 35,000, except for a few people who aren't sure. And in Joel, where the current funding is sufficient, and I've got to look up later to see what percentage that is. So, okay. Well, I can go ahead and leave this open until we come to the next poll in case anybody else wants to chime in there. I see we've got still some responses coming in, but with that, I think um, I will turn it over to Brittany. So okay. I will stop sharing. Work on sharing my screen. Okay. That was the wrong. There we go. All right. I see Debbie has a message in the chat saying it will depend on the tax ditch. Some are in better shape than others. And that is true. Did you want to elaborate any further on that? Debbie, you can do a thumbs up or thumbs down, or you can unmute yourself. Yeah, it, it, both of those questions I thought were, um, it's hard to generalize because each one is, is, has a unique situation. That was all I was just pointing out. 
Yes, I would agree with that. So questions just to get us going and thinking and, and see where some people's heads at or we're at. So it's good to see that. So for those of you who uh, haven't met me yet through this, my name is Brittany Haywood. I am the Tax Ditch Program Manager 1 for the Denmark Drainage Program. And today we're going to be covering, like Jen said, the financial aspect. So to start off, we're going to focus on how the money, how the monies are determined, the tax monies, and then we'll have a break and we'll go on to some of the limiting factors or factors that play into finances too. And as Jen said, we'll have polls scattered throughout. So in the beginning, I'm just going to review a couple of the slides that were in the very first presentation to kind of set the stage. So with financing tax ditch organizations at formation, so when the tax ditch was formed, began, a total assessment base was assigned and distributed across the parcels. And that total assessment base is based off of the cost of construction. And it's distributed across those parcels for which have their own assessment base, which varies depending on the drainage benefit. And those benefits depend on land use, parcel size, stipulations established, and we'll get further into that in a second. But I also wanted to point out that this assessment base that's assigned to the property is important because it equals the number of votes that the owner can have. So then you have your assessment base. Next is how the ditch tax is collected, and that's based off of the warrant rate. This rate is discussed and voted on at annual meetings. If there isn't an annual meeting, that, re rema that rate remains the same until it is changed. There are also special warrants, which are given under extenuating circumstances and have a short term of one year. And then the, for our office for processing, and we must have all of that information by May 1st. But the actual tax is collected through the county property tax bills. Again, we'll go more in detail to this, but I just wanted to give an overview. So that's the basis for how tax stitches are funded, but they also have some supplemental funds, which come in various forms. There's the state and county matching funds, or 3921. These, this funds in particular will be talked about in our next session. So that will save that conversation for then. And then there's also community transportation funds, which are relegated to projects that deal with roadside issues. Resource conservation and development funds, which deal with multiple landowners having issues and then grants and they can be any type of grant. There's some that relate to water quality, green infrastructure all over the place. So we try to leverage funds in the best way possible to assist tax ditches. But getting into the nitty gritty of how the assessment base is calculated, because this is the bottom line for how all numbers are figured out. And how that happens is kind of different depending on the two different ways a tax ditch can be formed. There is 100% agreement for which all those who want the tax ditch pay for it. So, for example, if you have a tax ditch watershed that has 10 landowners within it, three want the ditch, they agree to pay for it and cover it, and, and all the unky dory, then that is considered 100% agreement. However, only those three officers will get the vote. The seven others who don't pay it for it, don't have any assessment, don't get a vote, but they can still be officers. And then there's hearing and referendum, which is where the request gets put to a vote and how that vote shakes out. The, there could be stipulations put in place, um, different rates assigned. So the hearing and referendum is a lot more in depth and process based because you have to get a vote and approval for everyone to go through. So each one of these types of formations of tax ditch ultimately affects how the assessment base is assigned. Now there are two assessment base. One is the total assessment base, which we've mentioned before, and then there is one for each property. So kind of just to summarize everything, the assessment base is 
determined at formation of the tax ditch. It is determined from construction costs and the drainage benefit that parcel receives. Again, it is the basis for all for how all taxes are collected. And this base can change. And it's from items like land being brought into the watershed or taken out, parcels splitting, joining, additional infrastructure, and in rare instances, a court order change. But we don't like to go that route. So your total assessment base, again, I know I'm repeating myself, but it's <laughs> can get a lot. So the total assessment base is construction costs. That's whether it's creating the entirely new ditch or just upgrading an existing one to tax ditch standards. So here's an example of lingo. You can see the estimated cost $10,040 upon formation. And then now the total assessment base is 10,119, or I should say as of 2020. So those were, that's where those numbers come from. And they can vary widely. Here's an example of W and W where the ditch had to be broken up into different areas. So you see on the screen, there's nine different areas. Each have a total digging cost and a total seeding cost. And this one also has the pipe infrastructure. So this assessment base, it was estimated to be around 34.459 in 2020. It's 35.297. So these bases vary widely. So the lowest one I think we have is Naylor Wells of $600. And there's some that are a little bit different, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and then the highest one we have is Pencater at 894000 and 825. So again, very widely. You start from there. So the next is taking that large sum and distributing it to your parcels. And that's done through the relative benefits that parcel receives. And that includes elevation. So the lower the land, the more benefit the tax it receives. Soil type, if you have a type which doesn't allow water to infiltrate as well, it more runoff, then you receive more benefit from the ditch. Land use, more developed, the more benefit you receive. In proximity to the ditch, the closer to the ditch, the more benefit you receive. So all of those different benefits are considered when distributing costs to the parcels. So step one is to take that large sum and distribute it to sub watersheds. So here's an example of the W and W and you can see it broken out into those different zones or areas. And that cost is then distributed upstream downstream to those most benefit. So the best example right here is if you look at area six, which has a total constructed cost of $9,304.58. That cost is covered by area six itself area nine and area 10. And you can see the different percentage rates. So area six has 55%, area nine is 25% and area 10 is 20. These percentages are determined by the commissioners. They're the ones who determine how this percentage gets broken up and covered. So once you have your costs allocated by those who most benefit them, and so nine drains into 10 and 10 drains into six, that's kind of how it, it goes there. So once you have that allocated, then you move it to your parcels. And there's two different avenues for doing this. There is lots and there's a cost per acre. For lot rates, Lot rates are usually residential parcels, parcels, excuse me, usually under 10 acres with a house, and they are considered flat rates based on an area's given conditions or benefits. And the Board of Ditch Commissioners agrees on the lot rates upon formation of the ditch. And it is these lot rates 
which you use in the future if a parcel is then broken out into lots. So I'm going to give some examples of lot rates and how they were determined from W and W. So here's a, a parcel. So these two parcels within the circle have a lot rate of 350. And the reason for that is a their location. So they're located on a private ditch, which then drains into the tax ditch. So they're considered secondary. Their soil type is one that receives more benefit for the ditch and their residential land use. Here's an example of another one. So these two parcels circled have a lot rate of 125. They are also secondary located. So they are on a private ditch, which then outlets to prong four. They have a soil type, which doesn't benefit as much from the tax ditch and they are residential. And then the third example here is $75 which is tertiary. So they are within the watershed, but they don't have any direct drainage coming from that parcel to the tax ditch. They have a soil type, which doesn't really benefit as much and their land use is wetland. So again, doesn't benefit from a tax ditch. So any new parcels that fall into these different categories will be assigned these rates. So once all the lot rates are determined, that amount is taken from the cost of construction, constructing that zone. And then you go to look at your large parcels or your cost per acre. So these cost per acre uh, rates or parcels are ones that generally fall into a category where they have about greater than five acres and they're not primarily residential or commercial. And again, the next bullet is just talking about you take the lot costs, you subtract that from the total cost of construction, and then your remaining costs are what you use to help determine this cost per acre rate. So here is this parcel here we're looking at. Here's the different zones. So it has different benefits in there based off of soils, land use, again, determining how all that falls. And then there's a bunch of equations that go into determining benefited acres, cost per acre, which if you really wanna get into, we, we could. Uh, but ultimately for this parcel now, versus when it's formed on the left, the assessment base is $7,884.99. So it has a much larger base, but it's determined on benefits again. So once all of the cost per acre rates and lot rates are formed, there is the final assessment list, which comes out last. And that is for which you see all the different numbers. So this is a map which shows the, the revenue of each of those different parcels. So the larger the circle, the more revenue, the smaller the circle, the less. And you can see how that is distributed amongst the different parcels. So mentioning how you can change the assessment base or how it is changed, here is an example of where you have larger lots, excuse me, larger parcels, acreage, that is broken into lots. So this is Highland Acres. At formation, you can see on the left the parcels. So you have 1A, 1, 2, 3A. These are the large parcels. So at formation, their assessment base was $2,280. Well, as it got developed and lots were broken out, the 2020 assessment base is $12,913. So you can see how adding lots can increase the revenue here. So let me find my mouse. Here it is. So just to kind of summarize again, same slide assessment base set forth upon formation of the ditch. It's the total assessment base is determined from the initial cost of construction 
And then the parcel 1 is related to how much benefit that parcel receives. And it can change up or down based off of land being brought into taken out parcel splitting, joining, breaking into lots. Uh, the addition of infrastructure and again, in rare instances or order changes. So, 1 thing to note about this is the construction costs or are at the time of construction. So, some of these ditches were constructed. 50 years ago, so that number that assessment based number and whatever lot costs or. Or in rates that were determined, they are still the same as as 1 was determined. Back then, they just may have been developed out further. With that, and it wraps up that section for a poll. Jen. Okay, so that's a lot of information there. Uh, so I'm going to share just to kind of see where everyone is at. So how does everybody feel about all that information there? Everybody seems like they followed along pretty well or maybe not so much. Oh, good. We've got one. <laughs> Anyone else? I just want to see, you know, the, the assessment base uh, and the, the parcel tax rate is um, there's a lot of variables that go into it. Um, just wanted to check and see if if that was good for everyone or if there are any points of clarification or uh, anything that needs explained in further detail. So feel free to unmute too and see if you have anything that you wanted to add or or need a little more information on. And Rick, I see your comment about the Penn Cater tax ditch as how it was set up where everyone pays a lot rate. So as all development lots have been added, the amount collected has increased over the years. So the, yeah, the addition of lots has brought in more funding. So, so far, most people are doing okay. We've got a few people that may need a little time to digest, or maybe it's just the content, the subject matter in general. Um, but we'll keep going and if there's anything else, like, you know, feel free to to stop and ask questions as we go through um, just to make sure that everybody's getting what they need. Right. Okay. So All that, right, I will. Take back over. Okay. All right, so we have a little bit more to go and then we'll have a break. So the next, so we talked about assessment base constructing. Now, how do you get from that base to what the landowner actually pays? And that's through the warrant rates. It is a percentage rate and it is what is used to determine the yearly tax on a parcel. And it is the same rate across the entire tax ditch. So each tax ditch has the same rate that's applied to the parcels assessment base. It is determined by each of the officers and voted on at annual meetings. Again, if there is no vote, it remains or meeting, it remains the same. And it can be increased or decreased. And historically, our program has recommended a max increase of 90%. So to kind of put the assessment base and warrant rate information together. So for W and W tax stitch, their total assessment base is 352754. They have a warrant rate of 2%. So in total, they should be collecting $705.95. What this means for the lot rates we talked about. So the $350 lot rate we mentioned earlier with the 2% warrant rate would pay $7 a year. The $125 lot rate at 2% would pay $250 a year. 
the $75 lot rate at 2% would pay 150 a year. And then the cost per acre at $7,884.99 would pay two or 157.70 at 2%. So again, your assessment base changes related to the benefit that parcel receives, but the warrant rate remains the same. Is that making sense? Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs, I don't know. You can use your little emoticon things. There we go. Stop that one. <laughs> so that's the rate, how the rate is determined. So once the officers make the determination of what the rate should be for the year, that rate comes to our office, it gets sent to the districts for approval and then come on. and then our office compiles all that information and then sends it off to each of the county's billing offices so from there the billing offices send a bill to the landowners the landowners then are supposed to pay the bill which goes to the county and then the county distributes those funds back to the tax ditch. So there's lots of back and forth, but essentially it comes from the tax ditch to each county. The tax ditch tells the county what they want to bill. The county bills the landowner, the landowner pays, it goes back to the tax ditch through the county. And with that, we have another poll and then a break, a brain break. Um, so I see a question though. So does the upcoming county's reassessment affects the rates? No, it does not. The rates are determined. So the warrant rates are determined solely by the tax ditch themselves. It's completely separate. Any other questions, thoughts? Hey, Brittany, I have a quick question. Yep. Joe, of course, some people are probably going to think this is crazy, but is a, is a board of supervisor member on the Sussex Conservation District, we always approve or disapprove rate increases or decreases in their tax base or their, their warrant rate, their warrant rate, I should say. Why would we? It's never it's never happened since I've been there. But why would we deny it? We've always approved it. But why? What? Why would we deny that if that's what they voted to do, or is it just a formality? Michelle, if you're on here. I don't know if you have a history of. We've not recommended denial because they withdrew their request. But we had a few tax ditches years ago that wanted to really had their bank account for a while and they had sufficient funds to do a clean out more than one time. So we were going to recommend no. Uh, you can have a little too much money if you don't have the plan for it, too much temptation for the money to disappear or not be used as it should be used. So those would be really the only reasons um, or recommending denials if it's just going to be too much. It's not meant to to have enough money to clean it out every other year or every five years and, and have plenty of funds on hand like that when a clean out doesn't occur that often. Mowing's different. All right, that makes sense. Thank you. I think people already started answering this this poll question here, um, but it relates to what are your thoughts on reevaluating the assessment based allocations for tax ditch parcels? So, so far, uh, out of the responses we have, um, most people say that it's worth the time. Nobody says that it's not worth the time. Some people are undecided. And then we also have a little bit of time for questions, additional questions. 
So for this one, again, if anybody has any thoughts that they want to elaborate on their response here, feel free to unmute or, or put something in the chat box. And you can also feel free to come on comment or if you have any comments related to the assessment base and the fact that it is related to the cost of construction at the time it was constructed. So like those construction dollars may not equate in today's life, but I don't I don't know that it matters. So if you have any thoughts on this is Rick. What's the difference between doing that and just having each tax just increase their percentage of what they're collecting based on the existing estimate, which is what we've been asking them to do over the last few years? And, and that's a good question. So for some, there isn't, but others only have like the tax itch that only has an assessment base of six hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. You you can't get right. I mean, okay. You're limited by that amount. Yeah, I have a few like that. Yep. Okay. Uh, I'd like to chime in on the uh, that original construction cost. It is based on a major construction effort that was done years and years ago, and the maintenance required now it, it's not as um, is is extravagant so they don't need to dip out all that material and spread it around all that was done the that first time so it's generally you know you just need to do maintenance so the assessment bases you know you could argue that they may not be um, you know fair for today's conditions and of course we've got the encroaching uh, right away with fences and houses and things like that. So in some cases, the, the areas that have gone over had dramatic land use changes. It's worth, you know, maybe looking at those. Thank you. I saw, uh... Mike has a, a comment in the chat. Understand that people with no skin in the game can easily argue for increasing taxes. It's a harder sell out here in the real world. So I think those are all good points. And expenses <laughs> vary from from county to county. I know two years two years ago we did a fit uh, a, a reconstruction of the tax ditch in two phases, and each phase of each part of the tax, which was over $50,000 each. So it was over $100,000 to redo the entire system. This is Josh from the city of Dover. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Awesome. Um, so if I understand this right, it sounds like the assessment base can increase as lots within the tax ditch increase. But if the lots are not increasing within the tax ditch itself, the land's just kind of staying stagnant as it originally was when the tax ditch was created. The only way to really increase funds would be through the tax warrant rate, correct? Increasing the tax warrant rate. Yes, that is correct. Okay, just want to make sure I understood that. Thank you. No problem. And I think um, to Mike Brown's question or comment about harder to sell the taxes a little bit later. I think there's a poll question that gets at what are ideas for increasing funding that's outside of this tax realm. Throw ideas out there if you have any. Were there any other thoughts, questions, comments at this point? If yeah, not. Uh, this this is Joel. I'm sorry, I was a minute muted there. Uh, yeah, even though uh, the gentleman said a few minutes ago about the original construction cost of digging and spreading the soils, but you know uh, our tax ditch is in this situation where it's been 25 years since we've had a dip out. We know it's coming, uh, which is going to be a major expense. Uh, we have about a 10 mile tax ditch. We don't have any developments to deal with, thank God. But we know it's going to be pretty sizable amount. So, uh, you know, it's more than just when it's originally constructed. You know, every 20 or 25 years, 
you're going to have a major expense and that's not to include there's more than maintenance you know there could be emergency situations that uh you know also take a dent in your uh, bank account joel i think you had made a comment in our last session too about the cost you know and and the amount that's in your account that it's really only one emergency away from yes being a real issue yeah, we we had a uh, the ditch collapsed, and I sent uh, uh, not Michelle, uh, whom I, <laughs> Melissa. I sent some Melissa some pictures of some things we did on a tax ditch where we had a ditch collapse, and it might have been the total length of it might have been maybe five six hundred feet both sides of the ditch, and we got a we got a price from the district on repairing it, and the, the, the price was thirty five thousand dollars. Now you're talking about a tax ditch that normally kept about maybe seven or eight thousand dollars in our account, which no doubt got our attention. Uh, we were able to find another way to do it that really the district probably didn't had never done, but it saved us twenty thousand dollars, which saved us from having to get a loan and go through a lot of a lot of issues. Uh, so that really, at the end of the day, saved us. We didn't have to borrow money. Uh, we have raised our tax warrant rate. Uh, ours was originally like 4% when I originally got on as a tax. It's off. So we have since then raised it to 12% just because of we know the clean outs coming, the dip outs are coming, and we sort of have to have ourselves financially in that position to be able to pay for that. Not necessarily all in one year, but in multiple years. Mm -hmm. we, we had one tax ditch where all the pipes had rusted out because of a very acidic soil, so we ended up having to replace all the old corrugated metal pipes that rusted out with all the new black plastic pipes, and that was that was a quite an expense. So there's issues there. Just come up. And how do you end up funding that, Rick? If you don't mind me asking. That was the Herring Branch tax. So uh, some was taxes money, but a lot of it came out of the uh, either 3921 or other money that we get for drainage. And we assisted the tax dish in, in two phases over a couple of year period. Okay. I was wondering what was Joel? How did he uh, take care of that? His alternative. Uh, well, well, I sent some Melissa some pictures. I didn't know if she wanted to share them because I was hoping maybe other tax ditch officers in the future, you know, may want to consider this um, substantial savings. But to, in a nutshell, in case she doesn't want to share the pictures, uh, we originally had rip wrap priced as uh, the material that we would use on the edge of the bank after we put a netting material to hold the soil back. And I had a contractor that we work with uh, privately, and he told us that he had used uh, like block material that had not been recycled. So like uh, concrete blocks, that kind of thing, even though they were not grinded up fine, we used those on the bank after, that would be the last step is put that on the bank to hold the bank there. And I took some pictures before and after, and I even took a picture after vegetative growth started to grow through it. Now, in all fairness, we've not had a big rain event that's caused the tax ditch to flood again to see if this would work, but the contractor guaranteed me it would. He said he'd done it on several ditches uh, a few years back and said it's worked fine. Hey, Joel, Melissa, sorry, I'm going to take some um, I can try to get some information together for those on this call, but I know I do know that you did have a call savings on it. I, I didn't get around to getting that together. I'm sorry for that. But um, for those interested, I can I can send some information on what they did out there. Yeah, that, that's fine. I think it would be beneficial. You know, like I said, that was a big that was a that was a big savings to our ditch. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Okay, well, does anybody have any other thoughts or questions uh, before we go to a break? It's not a thought or a question, it's just a statement. If there was somebody, one example on there, and we know of people, and Gene and I were just talking about it, that they, I don't care how small their lot is, that they $1.25 a year. Uh, I'd, li I'd like to see them get a neighborhood kid to just run a lawnmower across the, the just the length of their ditch one time for a dollar twenty five. Get approached with, or not often, but we sometimes get approached with, is back taxes, and and we don't honestly we don't really know how to handle them. So this is a question where we will be posing questions to you all. So as of twenty nineteen is the latest data we have right now. In Sussex County, there were seventy seven thousand dollars in back taxes owed to taxages, which they have an interest of 26, according to the county. So it's a total of $103,000 that are ultimately owed back to the taxages. As of 2019, the highest amount was $6,000 from Highland Acres and the lowest amount was 53 cents for Chandler. So again, they vary, um, but Last we checked, it's our understanding that Sussex County does not uh, go after these back taxes if it's their primary residence. And there was an article back saying they similar things. The and but also to certain landowners, there is confusion surrounding lands that are in like ag lands preservation programs, which are exempt from certain taxes, but they are not exempt from tax ditch taxes. So education about that is definitely needed and we're not sure how to, to recoup the, these back taxes. So if you have any ideas, feel free to share now or later. Um, but this is one thing certain tax ditches do have issues with. And- Hey, Brittany, this is Rick. Does this mean that the landowner is not, not, not paying any of their taxes or they just subtracting out their ditch tax and not paying it. I, I don't know what that means, to be honest. We were they just have it, they have to pay it along with their county taxes on the tax bill, but yes, yeah. I'm not exactly sure. Okay. Um, we are just given a spreadsheet of all of the <clears throat> the taxes that were owed. So the <laughs> county would go after anybody who's not paying their taxes, it seems like to me. Hey Brittany, this is Heather. Um the one that we were working on, they were in a program where they didn't pay any county taxes, so they didn't have anything else to pay. But I have a feeling if they're not paying their ditch tax, they're not paying any of the taxes. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting topic to ponder. Because, as you can see, it could affect some tax ditches quite significantly. Um, I believe Highland Acres, from what I could tell, has recouped some of that from. From what I was looking at the expected versus actual reports that were coming in somehow, but. It is an issue to know about, but expenses, so you have your taxes you collect. People, some people pay them, most people pay them. Some people don't, but what are the actual expenses? So. Mowing, dip out repairs, those are all the common ones, but the ones that forget, are forgotten the most happen to be around the administrative costs, so bonding. So you are, as a tax offers officer, at a minimum, the secretary treasurer is supposed to be bonded, which is a yearly fee. You throw out $100, it's more or less, depending on what you do. But, I mean, if your tax ditch isn't bringing in $100, every year, then you don't have enough to cover bonding. And then there's your meeting notices. So paying for ads or postage or postcards, depending on how you want to advertise. And then your audits, if you're going to an outside agency for audits or just the required material. So banks are starting to charge for the back and front of checks, which is a required material for audits. So that's another cost, administrative cost that, that has to go into these tax ditches. Um, and one thing I wanted to share was a, a Excel sheet that Josh Barth from the city of Dover. Thank you, Josh uh, compiled 
for McKeeron Takstich of Prong 2 to try and get an understanding of how mowing and major maintenance affects this section of the ditch. Now, this is only a section, but there are a few other ditches who fall into this, this same category. So you can see over here on the right, their bank balance, their tax rate is 4%. If they raise it to 15%, you can see the total tax collected. So as of right now, it's 9730 and $3,600 or $364.89 if they raise it to 15 but you start to see that they may not have enough to support themselves at that rate. So this goes along to the saying of, of and can tax stitches support themselves with all these expenditures? And like Joel, you're saying, if you're if you have an issue, <laughs> how are you going to cover it? So this is a handy spreadsheet. Thanks, Josh, for pulling it together. We have a poll. Not a problem, Bruce. <laughs> okay, so it looks like we have a couple of questions here. Um, so I am going to share my screen again. So the first one, uh, I'll tell you what it is while I'm getting it pulled up. <laughs> Uh, is an open ended poll uh, if there are any items or things that we missed, any expenses that we didn't catch. You can also say no if you think no is the answer. <laughs> I mean, so we had mowing, dip out, repairs, and administrative expenses like bonding, meeting notices, and audit required materials. Feel free to unmute too and add a comment that way if it's just easier. I would say pipe replacement unless that falls under repairs, but that could be a big investment. I don't think your poll's set up. I tried to put it in a oh, shoot. <laughs> meeting meeting location rental. Legal. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the heads up there, John. Yes, that that legal is a good point because going back to the right away obstruction um, conversation we had before, we, so in order for a tax ditch to address an obstruction or issue, there, there's really two options. One is you turn it over to Denrec, and then the tax ditch loses all say in how that obstruction is handled, and the other is to have legal counsel themselves. Officer uh, pay, which is not very many, I believe, anymore that are doing it, but it is still an option and an expense. Michelle, where those situations are, are those larger ditches or something where there's kind of more of a time commitment involved? Well, it requires a vote at a duly called meeting because the funds do come from the taxes collected and it's very small stipend anywhere from $50 to I think the highest I've seen, I think was like $600, but they were the larger systems primarily. And a lot of those now, those officers have backed off accepting that pay and are back to, but it was to help them with gas driving, you know, 20, 30, 40 miles of channel. It was a lot of time and investment of the, you know, expense to them. Gotcha. Right, so people had a lot of ideas once I opened up the poll for expenses that we had missed. Or at least more specific, you know, instances uh, of examples for the kind of things that we have. 
So we've got another one here as well. This is another open-ended poll. What resources are needed to assist tax ditch officers with financial planning needs for maintenance? And again, it seems to be working pretty well if people want to unmute and answer that way too. This is Josh from the city of Dover. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, as Brittany shared, I made that spreadsheet. I'm I'm huge into spreadsheets, so <laughs> I try to be as standard as I can. Obviously, standardized as a scientist, but um, I'm just thinking in terms of tax ditches and financial planning, since I managed two ditches for the city, and that's why I made the spreadsheet. Was I was trying to think if there's some standardized format to where I could almost plug and chug, right? make you can plug in the numbers that are applicable to that specific tax tax ditch and you can plug in different variables and everything's automated it all automatic automatically populates so you can see the outcome and i just think i know for us at the city of dover and i'm sure other tax ditches if there was some sort of standard program out there that can help us plan long term uh, where you could plug in these standard variables of cost for mowing, cost for dip out, cost for bank fees, and whatever fees you have coming up in the future. And if you could see an output, you know, of how much money you need to have in your account by that time, and then you can calculate what the tax warrant rate needs to be so you can get to that, so you can make sure you're at that point. I just think it would be really beneficial if we had some sort of standardized program uh, that tax ditches could take advantage of. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. And so for the earlier poll, the people that answered um, that, that weren't quite sure what the resource needs were for the um, for maintaining tax ditches. And I think with the information that we've gotten since then, I think we're talking about some sort of template there. Like, is that a resource that would be helpful? You can give a thumbs up if if that would work or what makes sense. I also see that we have to clone Gene Vanderwin. Like I, I'm getting <laughs> that from the responses here. Yeah, there's a thumbs up. <laughs> Good use of emoticons. Okay. So any other thoughts on this before we move on? So the next thing that we have is, uh, can enough funds be raised to cover tax ditch operations? And I think our, our fundraising discussion. Yep. All right. Let me share screen. All right, so here we're going to talk about some of the ways that exist um, that tax stitches have not necessarily gotten more funds, but become more efficient with their, their funds and some of the options others have asked us to explore. So the first one that uh, has been brought up is related to combining tax stitches. So this can be done. Um, there's two different ways of the process really happening, and it depends on if they are created under the same court order or a separate court order. And one reason for combining ditches is you have a bunch of like meadow branch pictured here. You have three separate meadow branches. Why not combine them into one? This has been done recently for Gum Branch, and there's others like Pepper Creek, Tyndall Branch, Williams Canal. And there is a process that's in, that is involved with it. If it's under the same court order, it's a little bit easier. You just have a vote of the taxables, and then 
if it's in favor, you have a court order change. If it's created under separate court order, court orders, then it becomes a little bit more complicated because you have to have meetings of of all the different tax which is affected. They have to vote in favor, and then you have to file your decree with the appropriate agency. But some examples to show. So here's Williams Canal on the left. It's one, two, three, four, five different and you can see their assessment base. So they have one ditch only has an assessment base of 330. If you were to combine them, you wouldn't have to deal with all these different small pieces. You could deal with it on a whole on the whole. And then here's the example of Meadow Branch who one section has 50,000, 5 and 16. So it's there you can combine them to help make managing them easier and funding them a little bit more straightforward. So that's one option that's been posed. Another one is, can I get rid of a ditch? Yes, you can. In order to do that, it solves the problem because then you don't have to worry about funding it at all if it's gone. It must be public and advertised at least 10 days prior for a meeting, like all meetings that the officers have. The taxables will vote on it, but the majority of all taxables most must vote. So that's not just who comes up to the meeting. And then if the majority are in favor, you have to prepare a petition to the conservation district. The conservation district determines if dissolution is in the public interest and all obligations of the tax ditch have to be met, met, paid in full. And then the petition to the superior court for dissolution then goes. So there is a method for that. And then, hey, Brittany, it, yep. This is Josh from the city of Dover. Sorry to interrupt. I just had a quick, quick question. If I could interject, what are the, what is it? What would the all obligations of the tax ditch need to be met? Like, what would those obligations be exactly? Monetarily, so no outstanding bills. Um, that that sort of. Ah, okay. Paid, paid that, all your debts. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Any other questions? I see Joel, Joel had one in the, yep, in the chat there where he asked, does this save money? And I'm, I'm not sure if that came in during the dissolving a tax ditch or the combining a tax ditch slide. That was for the combining part. Okay, thanks. I don't know if it necessarily saves money, um, but like if you have, Three different ditches with all the same name, they technically are supposed to submit an audit for each of the different ditches. And well, so I guess, yes, then it could save money because if you have the administrative fees associated with maintaining each of those three ditches, you can combine it into one and it saves on those administrative costs from managing them separately. You can do it all as one. So it saves on that side. You also would end up getting. Your let me go. So your warrant rate is ten percent. So if you combined, it would be ten percent of this sum, which could then be allocated throughout the entire system instead of only that ten percent staying within the the S twenty two section of the ditch. So you could use your funds to you could have larger amount of funds to tackle problems throughout the system instead of focusing just a little in a little area. Does that make sense? All right, then the other question we often get is why can't DENREC take over? Well, the biggest reason is, is not the intent of the way the tax ditches were set up. They were meant to be run by the people who live there uh, or own land there. So it, it doesn't really make sense. Secondly, we don't have the staff to manage the ditches, but there is a process outlined in the law for, to do so. It first requires approval from DENREC it also requires written consent of half of the landowners owning half of the land in that tax ditch. So that that's going to be your that's going to be hard to come by. Um, but with that, it transfers any specified maintenance 
the rights away, all powers of the tax ditch, and call meetings with at least three taxables. So you don't have to have annual meetings per se, but you can call a meeting with just three people, three of the taxables, and it discontinues any of the officers. So with this, the landowners get no say in, in how things are going. There question. Am I hearing things? Has that been done before? Has Denrec taken over tax ditches? Not to my knowledge. Anyone who's been around longer? Not in the 36 years I've been with the drainage program. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, big girl? All right, so we are wrapping up comments or wrapping up with comments with a poll. Okay. Yeah, so we've got two more questions here to kick off our discussion section. And the first one is with the current outline process, do you think tax ditches can collect sufficient funds to perform routine tax ditch operations? And I think this is another one where it might depend on the tax ditch, but always good to see where people are coming from. Mm -hmm. Like if it depends on how much they have the ability to tax based on that, that first rate. Okay. So half yes, 30% no, and 20% not sure. So that might be a reflection of what you're saying there, Brittany. Okay. And then the last one that we have for the day to start is an open-ended poll. Any ideas out here to increase funding to tax ditches? And feel free to respond via voice. <laughs> yeah, we're just we're kind of opening this up um, for a discussion period. So, however anybody wants to chime in, so voice, poll, chat, carrier pigeon. Can you hear me? Yep. Hi, Richard. Hi. Well, it would seem that the one way of course would be to increase the tax assessment upon the uh, uh, folks that are drained by the tax ditch uh, of course we know the unpopularity of that um, just a curious question with the attention uh, primarily at the federal level for increased investment in long-term infrastructure um you know is there a possibility that that uh, that we could advocate for part of that investment in infrastructure uh, go to increase uh, cost sharing with tax ditch associations Uh, this is John Inkster. I'd like to add on to what he said about infrastructure. We've never really looked at it, but now Dell dot has all of their pipe uh, road um, channel network mapped. And that might be a good thing to itemize the length of Dell dot road drainage. That's going into tax stitches to see in terms of you know, what level of infrastructure support the tax ditch is providing. Um, and then a, another thing, uh, just a short story that Sonny Clogg, many of you may have heard him, 
he uh, shared this story with me when I started working here. And that was when the idea of paying fairly for tax ditch work. Uh, imagine it's Saturday morning and people in a drainage area want to uh, dig out their ditch. So everybody starts at the very bottom end of the ditch and they start working. And as soon as you get to the top of your parcel, you can go home. And so by the end of the day, the only people that are left digging are the ones that live at the very upper ends of the watershed. So they've put in the most work, they're getting the most value from all that downstream drainage. So, you know, looking at the way assessments are and the way things that are, you know, fairly uh, assessed, it's kind of good to keep that story in the back of your mind that, you know, you, you put in as much effort as the value of the drainage that you're getting. In terms of funding, you know, as an idea, doesn't DINREC offer like low interest uh, loans for some things, whether it's water wastewater projects or, or is that more for like private residents looking to replace their septic tank and they can't really afford to replace their septic tank so they can get a low interest loan through DINREC? Has that ever been kind of looked at maybe to help tax ditches supplement if they have need funds? Is there any way something like that can maybe be structured? So I know the low interest loans are for septics, but I don't know of them from our side of the house. Got gotcha. you. And presently there's been uh, the availability of low interest loans through farm credit, but the tax ditches would need to be primarily in ag or at least a good part of it in ag in order to be eligible for such a loan. Okay, thank you. you might be there are low cost loans available through our state revolving loan fund. And so it's just a matter of um, getting those individuals all together to be able to um, take on a loan of that magnitude to do the maintenance. And it sounds like in the past that that has the legwork was done with a particular tax ditch. However, the contracts were never executed, so it was never completed. But um, the everything is there to be able to do that for the future if that's one of the, what the organizations wish to do so. Several years ago up in Newcastle County, back in the 80s, we, ha we have four urban tax ditches up in Alban Park and we only paid for the drainage infrastructure and they, had, they, they needed to repave the alleyway behind their homes and they took out a three year special warrant to, uh, to all collect more money in order to pay off the cost of doing the roadway. It wasn't a loan, but they raised the, the rate for three years to do it. So, Marsha, for the loan you're talking about, who would be the contact person for that, try and start that if someone was interested? Our environmental finance section, um, okay. Greg Pope is who I've talked to. And Jim Sullivan, who may be on the call today, I'm not sure, he is also very familiar with um, their programs. I have a lot of good ideas in the chat. Uh, or, I'm sorry, on the poll. So fairly distributed existing funds. Joel made a comment to that effect in the chat box as well. Um, use of county equipment and personnel for mowing increased 3921 funds. Request additional funding from legislature. This might might be my favorite. Start a Dean Vanderwin kissing booth with the proceeds going to the tax ditches. Dean, you know you'll have to weigh in on on your favor for that one. Um, educating legislators on the importance of tax ditches. Um, and then years ago, the General Assembly. <laughs> Created funding for drainage work over time. Denrick shifted those funds into salaries for positions. So the possibility, if Denrick is willing to request additional funding in that line for drainage work, 
which is currently funded at 1.1 million. And I think that's another vote for uh, Gene Van Der Wink kissing booth. So. Hey, Jen, it's Joel. Yep. The 3921 funds. What is that amount? 225,000 or something, if my memory's right. Is that what that is? That sounds um, right. Somebody, That's correct. Somebody yep. mentioned about increasing. How long has that number been set Been set at that uh, number? Does anybody know? I mean, you know, it, the last meeting that we had, I went and looked that up. And um, because there was some conversation about the um, equity of fairness of distributing those funds across the state. And so I went back to statute and found that I don't know how long it's been in there. Um, and I can research that to find out, but it is definitely split out in language that it's $75,000 per county. Yeah, I mean, that's not very much. I mean, if that's been like that for, it's been like it for five years, it's still too low, but I'm guessing it's probably been that for a lot longer. So no doubt. Yeah, Debbie chimed into the chat box and she said about 1993 questioning wow. that. Yeah, it's been, been a while. Debbie's very close. If that's not the case, it's either 92 or 93. It went from 60,000 up to the 75,000. And the reason that actually hasn't been completely looked into to change, it's been a discussion just about every year, is that in order to open that law and get that number to change, you are exposing the entire law to legislators making other changes throughout the entire law. It's a very um, advantageous law, the way it was written for the conservation districts and for Denrec to be able to use the conservation districts as, a, as an arm to get a lot of work done. So there's always been a little bit of concern of opening the law to that exposure. And that actually started, the conversation was started by a gentleman, many on this call will remember, named Mary Ireland, was the one that always, he always cautioned us to not open that law to that exposure. So that doesn't mean we shouldn't, doesn't mean that we shouldn't get there, but uh, that's the reason, Joel, that it has not been done. Okay, it's the first time I've ever heard that, but thank you for letting me know. And that can definitely be one of the recommendations from this work group. Something that we capture in the notes and we can take forward into a report. I think if that's the case, if that's something that people are interested in, we might want to be very specific about what recommendations, what we would recommend to change and what we would recommend to stay the same. Yeah, so the next session will go into 3921 and matching and all that a little bit more in depth. So that's something we could chat about more in the next one if if need be. Has it been looked in or thought of to seek pandemic relief funds, whatever that's money, pot of money is called for the states for tax ditches? Which would give so you, relief to the landowners not to increase their taxes while they're going through the pandemic. So we submitted a request um, to acquire some of the funding for assistance. There's no guarantee on that funding, and it was pulled with a larger group of projects from the department that's also competing with DelDOT. So it is on the list, yes, um, but I have no idea what that priority is for the ranking of that. Um, but I can definitely keep everybody updated on that. Any other thoughts, ideas, questions, comments? We are wrapping up here, wrapping up early for once. <laughs> I was going to say, Brittany, if you want to pull up the next slide about our uh, our next schedule or our, yep. our upcoming schedule. Okay, so this is the, the fifth work group meeting here, financing tax ditches. So we have two more uh, where we're looking at 
uh, different topics and content. So as, as Brittany mentioned, the next one is on 3921 funds on August 25th, uh, and then one on September 8th with limited resources as it relates to tax ditch officer retention and turnover. So two important topics. And then we come back on September 29th with a wrap up um, the uh, reporting out the work group findings. Um, so that's what our schedule looks like. Is is there anything else that people have uh, related to the, the tax ditch financing that we've talked about today? It looks like here's an overview of, of that next one on August 25th. So let me ask this, um, leading up to our next session, we've got Title VII, Chapter 39, 3921, which is uh, if people were looking at the law and that question about opening up the law, would they review just this section or how much of it um, would you have to look through? in order to make those recommendations? Is it tightly focused on this piece here or is there, do you have to look at all of chapter 39 or what are, what are the thoughts there? And Jen, did you, see Deb, did you see Debbie's comment in the chat? No, I didn't, thank you, Joel. Debbie has inventory the tax ditch system in the state and develop a cost to upgrade the tax ditch systems. Once a cost is developed, apply for infrastructure funds to help fund the improvements. So I think we have kind of a pilot project to that effect in two watersheds right now. That includes quite a bit of the tax ditch system in Kent and Sussex County. Is that the one I saw on the list of projects that I was talking to Dave Baird at the meeting last week about, it's supposed to be a pilot project on how to manage, uh, how the district could manage tax ditches for the tax ditches themselves or something like that? No, that's a different, um, a different thing. The Debbie Absher, yep, again, the Upper Nanny Code PL566 project. So um, I'm not sure if you've seen Ann Baldwin give a presentation related to uh, uh, this project. And the somebody who, who knows the details should probably chime in and talk, but the idea was, I think, to assess uh, the resource needs in into watersheds and develop a plan for the kind of practices that need to be in place to address those issues and so then you'd have an estimate you'd have um a listing of the work that needs to be done that you could then go back and apply for implementation funds to address that that need okay. i think the one dave mentioned was something we've talked about up here was trying to have the funds collected and the district manage the funds and do the maintenance work is a, I think that's a pilot project. Perhaps you got funded, but I might be wrong about that. You're right, Rick. I'm right. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think, um. Taking it to the next level of what I was thinking with the, about the infrastructure funds. Was well, someone mentioned last at the last meeting about engineering that these tax ditches were engineered for ag and it's no longer ag and, and some of the engineering principles have obviously improved since then that it wouldn't just be for what the resource issues are but maybe the overall engineering of the tax stitches themselves um, and to bring them up to current standards which i would imagine would be a huge um, number in cost <laughs> To do something like that. I don't even know if it's something that can be done. It was just a thought. So just to add a little bit to that inventory idea. So I know that me and Marsha did submit a request to, to try to get some funds to contract that type of work out to someone. Um, I don't know if we'll get the money, but obviously just having a good infrastructure of all the pieces of the tax ditches across the state would obviously be helpful in helping to plan for the future. So we're, we're trying to 
move in that direction. Uh, obviously, we need funds to do so, but that is on our radar. Um, and yeah, I think both the Upper Nanico project, that's watershed planning kind of components that have a field inspection associated with it will help to build those inventories, um, as well as the pilot project that the district has gotten funded for some ditches down south. So hopefully we can work together to leverage all of those pieces and uh, projects that are happening kind of independently to, to add to our information, which obviously we need to keep planning for what comes next. Um, and then as far as I know, Jen, you brought up how far into the law for next session we should read. I can say that I initially was going to say just that subsection, but I will have to look a little bit further into chapter 39 and then push it back to chapter title seven in case it, it gets bigger than that. So I will try to do that uh, this week so I can get that information out pretty quickly for the group that's uh, invited to that so that you guys can feel a little bit more prepared. Um, because yes, I did not know that until now. So I want to get some more information to you guys on that. Yeah, um, I, that's a fair answer. You know that, <laughs> that we need to look into that to see, to get a little more background. Uh, I did drop a link to Title Seven, Chapter 39, Section 3921. So if anybody wants to take a look and review at least that piece ahead of our next session. Um, there you go. And I just wanted to add on the topic of like trying to gain an understanding of what's going out there. Currently, we we're starting to use well, we have been using and we're starting to use more uh, GIS applications. Uh, survey 123 inspection forms. We've created an inspection form and we have staff that are as their time allows go out and start to document issues and and the pipes and structures that are out there in the field. So we're starting to work to that. And then that kind of alludes to what Melissa was saying about the project we've put in for to try and pull all of that information together. Okay. Anything else for today? I, did, I just have one thing. Um, this is Debbie. Uh, Going back to the 3921 funds and knowing that we're going to be discussing them next week, uh, I just thought I would throw this out here. We just finished our our sign up, ended on Friday, and so what's you know we would normally get 175, no, we get about 200 thousand dollars because Sussex County gives additional money to uh, help us out with the tax stitches. Our total request for cost share. Was over 360,000. So, uh, you know, the need is there for additional funding. And I will say, I do know that there's some tax stitches that didn't submit requests just because they knew there was a lot of requests already. So they were just going to hold off to, for, to allow someone else with more need. But it just keeps building up, <laughs> you know. We're not going to be unless something changes. We're not going to be in any better situation next year. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't disagree with the tax. It's just holding back their requests if they know that the money's not there. But this, this comes back to other issues we deal with. Those of us that are on this call at the state and and, and district level. Like even with our cover crop program, uh, we hear in our board meetings a lot where the, the farmers want to know what we're going to pay before they'll submit their acres and such. But how are we supposed to know the total need out there if they don't give us the information? So I, I would encourage if you guys ever have discussions with tax hitches that aren't putting in a request because they know the money's not there, to so please at least give us the data. Because how are we supposed to go to the legislature and give them this inventory we keep talking about and tell them what the real need is? If they won't tell us because they know we don't have the money. So we we need their help too. If they want us to continue to lobby for them and, and to work hard to try to get them additional resources. Those are both really good additions to the, the discussion. Good points. Okay. Let's see. Anything from Melissa, Brittany, Marsha, before we wrap it up for the day. Okay. 
Okay. Then it sounds like we will be in touch with uh, some more information, and the next time that we'll get together is August 25th. Thanks, everybody, for your good comments today, and we really appreciate the feedback. Thank you.